how good and pleasant is it when brothers dwell together in unity. Welcome to our Good Friday service and thank you. Thank you for embracing the kingdom, kingdom principle of standing together with one voice. We have the voice of hope because by his death on the cross, Jesus canceled every claim and silenced every accusation of Satan. Because of the cross, God has given us the basis of everything we need in life and in eternity. So with that, let's stand to our feet. Let's give God some praise. Let's give him a shout of praise. Let's give him a hand of praise. Can we tell God how good he is today? As we jump into worship, we want to let all children know that children's ministry has begun. So feel free if you have children, they can go ahead and go to the back, grab coloring pages. And with that being said, let's begin to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. All right, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Sing it with me. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. I'll praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure. Praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when I'm numbered. Praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the word. My enemies drown As long as I'm breathing, I've got a reason. I'll praise when I don't. I'll praise because I know you're still in control. Because my praise is a weapon. It's more than a sound. Oh, let me hear you shout it out. My praise is the shout that brings Jericho down. Sing this with us. I'll praise because you're sovereign. I'll praise because you're sovereign. I'll praise because you reign. I'll praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise because you're faithful. I'll praise because you're true. I'll praise because there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise because you're sovereign. I'll praise because you reign. I'll praise because you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise because you're faithful. I'll praise because you're true.
Thank you. Thank you, Lord. He is most worthy of praise. Uh, feel free to take a seat. This morning we are, we are going to journey with Jesus as he makes his way to the cross. And, and our first stop along the way is the Last Supper. And I'm going to invite Pastor Terry from two New Hope Methodist to come and share with us. Try that again. Good morning. This is a good, good day. It's Good Friday. There's a slide that's going to come up now that reminds us of the fact that the Lord did not check who's in this, who in the house was worthy. He checked for the blood, the blood. And interesting enough, it's a good day. It's a good Friday because of the blood. He checked for the blood on the top of the doorpost. None of us are worthy. Only the blood of Jesus can cover us. Then I want to read for you a song that probably you're all very familiar with. I'm trying to keep it very simple. For my pardon... This I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. In other words, there's no other thing but the blood. For my cleansing this I plead, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing for the sin can atone. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace. That's where it comes from. That's where it started. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. First Corinthians chapter 11, 23 to 26. As you came in, hopefully you received your communion elements. And if you don't have them, if you just raise your hand, I'm not sure we'll bring them to you. So if you need your communion elements, please raise your hand. And we'll take them together. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you, the Lord Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Throughout the communion service, and often in churches, you'll see the communion table. And it says, Do this in remembrance of me. God wants us to remember that sacrifice because it reminds us of the incredible love that he has for each of us. Because all of us have a bad day now and again. And we need to be mindful of the fact of God's incredible love. And often we forget. And so he says, do this in remembrance of me. So I just encourage you to open the top of your... Um, element and take out the wafer or the cracker. This is the body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of him. Take ye and remember that Jesus died for you and loves you. In the 
same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this is a cup, is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Another reminder of his incredible love for us. Because of that sacrifice, we call today Good Friday. Because it was an amazing demonstration of God's love for each of us. So let's peel the other side. But I not peel it upside down. And this is very, um, it's very important that you don't bite your nails because if you do, you're not going to be able to open it. So take drink and remember, this covers all our sins. The seen and the unseen. The good, the bad, and the ugly. It takes care of all of it. Nothing but the blood covers all of our sin. From our darkest and dirtiest secrets. Jesus has taken care of it because he loves you. Take drink in his name. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful day that you've given us. We thank you for your supreme sacrifice that was made for us, for the blood that was shed so that we might have life. And not just life here and now, but so that we might have abundant life and so that we might have eternal life. Thank you, Father, for spilling your blood for us as a reminder of that incredible love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
dressed in his righteousness alone the fall is stand before the throne it's in Christ alone in Christ alone now we see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Pastor Fred from Crosslands is going to come and, and share with us, and you can take a seat. So Jesus and his disciples, they left the dinner, and they left the city. They went under cover of night, and John, in John's Gospel version, he tells us that they crossed over the Kidron Valley. And uh, this was a valley that that divided the city of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives to the east. The first mention in the Bible of the Kidron Valley is when King David was on the run from his rebellious son. And it says in the Second Samuel text that, that he and his, his retinue, they left and they crossed the Kidron Valley while all the people mourned. And the Hebrew word that is the root of Kidron, uh, it means something like mourning. It means mourning and, and, and darkness and dirty. Because the subsequent mentions of, of the Kidron Valley in the Old Testament are when they, they would purge the land, they would purge even the temple of the idols, these, these idols of foreign gods, and they would, they would dispose of them, they would destroy them, they would burn them in the Kidron Valley. And I wonder if, if this is sort of the mental image that came to David's mind when, when he, he said, walking through the valley of the shadow of death. And this is the valley that Jesus and the disciples walked through on their way to the garden. And Matthew and Mark tell us that they went to a garden called Oil Press in Aramaic. And it was an olive grove. Some scholars believe that there was an oil press in the garden where he was. And they would grow olives and they would press them. They would, they would squeeze them. They would crush them. In the ancient Near East practice, they, they would first dig a pit and they would put the recently picked olives in the pit, cover them with salt, and they would warm up in the pit and they would soften and sweat before they were ready for being pressed. It was almost like uh, the, the kind of, um, you would purify metal in a crucible. It was like a crucible for olives. And it's funny that the word crucible, for some reason that's not clear, the root of the word crucible is the Latin word crux, which means cross. And it's a euphemism, a metaphor for an ordeal or a test. And, and this was not the, this is not the first test in a garden. Because one of our earliest stories, the primordial story of the original humanity in a garden, facing the choice of life or self-will. And they chose self-will, and by doing so, they chose death over life. They chose death over the giver of life, Adam and Eve in the garden. One of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Isaiah, has a few songs that he wrote that have been categorized by scholars as the servant songs. Some go further to say they're the suffering servant songs. And Isaiah 53, 10 says, it was the Lord's will, it was Yahweh's will to crush this servant, this messianic figure, the person we anticipate. It was the Lord's will to crush him. And so here's Jesus in the garden with his disciples, but alone, because they fell asleep. And it's in the garden. Luke tells us that he sweats. He sweats blood. Because in moments of intense stress, intense anxiety, it's possible that the capillaries can burst in your body resulting in your body leaking blood as you sweat in the intensity and the agony. And here is Jesus in the garden facing this in incredible 
test, this ordeal, this crucial question, what will you do in the past, the path laid out before you? And it's funny again, the word crucial literally means cross-shaped. It's a choice, it's one way or the other. Will you choose self-will? Because Jesus doesn't. He says, I pray that this cup would pass, that I wouldn't have to drink the cup, which is ironic because he just drank it. He said to his disciples, this cup is the, the new covenant, my blood, blood shed for you. The cup in the Old Testament represents the consequences of God's judgment. And Jesus is saying, I don't want to drink this cup, but your will, not mine. Your will, not mine, be done. And he makes this decision alone because his disciples were all asleep out of exhaustion and grief. How could he possibly make this decision? One reason, I think, is that this wasn't his first time in the garden. John gives us the clue in his gospel that Judas knew where to find him because he was there often. Jesus often went to the garden. And I wonder if he didn't go to the garden many times and pray this prayer many times and give up his will many times in practice for this ultimate crucial question. If you were to go to Jerusalem today, uh, there are a number of sites that claim to be the original. One of them, which is likely the real one, still has olive trees there. And despite the fact that the Romans raised the city in 70 AD and again in 132, they cut down all the olive trees. But an olive tree will regrow from the root. And so these are the same trees that Jesus found solace under. Regrown despite being cut down. Resurrected life. The same garden today. And we all face our gardens. I don't know if you've ever experienced a time of, of, of pressure, of crushing. And in those moments, we are faced with the challenge. Do we choose self-will? Or do we say to our Father, your will, not mine, be done. But here's the beauty of it. Here's the beauty of it, is that we do not face this challenge alone. Because the olives were not crushed for no reason. The olives were crushed to release the oil. And throughout the Old Testament, and the New, one of the strongest metaphors that oil is used for is for the Holy Spirit. And Jesus' death released the Spirit to us. The Spirit that heals. The Spirit that brings new life. The creative Spirit that brought life over chaos. The creative Spirit that commissions, that empowers. And so we have the ability, we have the resource of God's very Spirit. The oil that was poured out by Jesus crushing so that we can, like Jesus, say, not my will, but yours be done because through that is the path of life. Father, I thank you that we are not alone, that you have left your spirit, that Jesus will, was willing to be crushed according to your will so we could have life. Thank you.
Jesus, he willingly takes up this cross and he carries it to Golgotha. And Pastor Austin from Alive Church is going to come and, and lead us in reflection. It's such an honor to be among the body and worshiping together. Amen. Today I'm going to be speaking from the time of when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane up to when just before he's arrested, just before he's crucified. On the Thursday, he's having Passover meal with his disciples. Then as we learned, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, we don't know the exact hour that Jesus was arrested, but most believe it to be around midnight. So from, and then we do know the exact hour that he was crucified, which was at 9 a.m. Friday morning. So from midnight to 8 a.m. 30, Jesus had gone through six trials. Three of these trials were with Jewish leaders, and the other three were with Roman leaders. In the, in the Jewish trials, Jesus went before two high priests named Annas and Caiaphas who had a great deal 
of power as well. He went before the Sanhedrin, which were a group of 23 Jewish judges. So throughout the three trials from midnight to 6 a.m., Jesus is being tried by the Jewish leaders. And then he's handed off to the Romans to be tried by Pilate and Herod. And so during the Jewish trials, the Jews found Jesus guilty. But guilty of what? Blaspheme. They found him guilty for saying that he is God. Caiaphas commanded by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah. And Jesus answers, it is as you say. Now in the Roman trials, Jesus was passed from Pilate to Herod and then back to Pilate. And, and Pilate, Pilate states himself, I find no fault in him. In John 19, one through four, it says, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the soldiers placed a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they put on him a purple robe and said, hail, king of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and saith unto them, behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Jesus was the only person in history to be both scourged and crucified because being scourged was so horrific. Now, I want us to really feel the weight of the cross because it's, it, and what it meant for Jesus to be up there because even before he's crucified, he's first scourged. And being crucified was one of the most embarrassing and painful forms of torture that you could ever go through. And before that, he's scourged, which is another painful and unbearable form of torture. And so I'm going to read parts of an article from the American Medical Association, which is a, a non-Christian organization, but I think, it, I think it brings a lot to the severity, for us understand, understanding the severity of the torture. When a decision was made to scourge an individual, the victim was first stripped completely naked so his entire flesh would be open and uncovered to the beating action of the torturer's whip. When in this locked position, the victim couldn't wiggle or move trying to avoid or dodge the lashes that were being laid across his back. Once the victim was harnessed to the post and stretched over it, the Roman soldier would begin to put him through unimaginable torture. It was so ghastly that the mere threat of scourging could calm a crowd or bend the will of the strongest rebel. The victim's back, buttocks, back of the legs, stomach, upper chest, and face would soon be disfigured by the slashing blows of the whip. Historical records describe a victim's back as being so mutilated after a Roman scourging that his spine would actually be ex exposed. Now, I'm not going to continue on with the article because it goes into even greater detail of how bad this is, but, but now we, get, uh, we have an understanding of what Jesus looked like, what the beating was to Jesus that morning. So what toll did the Roman whip have on Jesus' body? Now, the, the New Testament doesn't tell us exactly, but in Isaiah 52, 14, it says, But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he seemed hardly human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. Every time I think about the scourging that Jesus received that day, I think about the promise that God makes us in Isaiah 53, 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. In this verse, God declares that the price for our healing would be paid by the stripes that were laid across Jesus' back. Because of what? Jesus went through, we have the power to be healed mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Then, after Jesus is scourged, he has to carry a 70 to 125 pound crossbar across his back. And this paints a beautiful picture of a man who has been, who has been betrayed, beaten with every step. He is in pain. With every step, he is limping closer and closer to his death. 
Jesus took on the stripes so that we could be healed. And so how do we practically respond to this message? Number one, we need to take hold. We need to take hold of the healing that is ours because of what Jesus went through. Wherever we are broken, wherever we are broken, Jesus provides full healing. He provides full healing, whether that be physically, mentally, emotionally, or spiritually. And number two, we need to deny ourselves. In Luke 9, 23, it says, Then he said to them all, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. In other words, what this means is we need to deny our souls. Our souls are, are made up of our mind, our will, and our emotions. So what Jesus is saying is we need to deny our will, our mind, and our emotions. Our mind says, I think. Our will says, I want. Our emotions say, I feel. So when we deny ourselves, we begin to say, it's not what I want. It's what God wants. It's not what I think. It's what God thinks. It's not how I feel but it's what the Holy Spirit impresses upon me. So that's what it means to deny ourselves. But what does it mean to take up our cross? It's the place where we can lay our life down. It's the place where we can lay our life down. When Jesus went to the cross, he said, no man taketh my life from me. I have the power to lay it down. I have the power to take it up. And Jesus chose, Jesus chose to lay his life down. And we must also choose to lay ours down. I choose to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Why don't you bow your heads with me? Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for taking those stripes for us. Jesus, we thank you for what you did for us. Jesus, thank you that we can be healed by the stripes that you took upon yourself. Thank you for laying your life down, being an example for how we are to live, Lord. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
except for a heart to you. Don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you've got a lion inside of those songs. Get up and praise the ask you to take your seat again and Pastor Phil from Alive Church, he's going to come, we're going to change up gears a little bit, and he's going to share an opportunity that we have together to make an impact in our community. Hello everyone. You can say hi back, it's okay. Hello everyone. <laughs> it's good to see you all. This is such an important service where we come together as one church, one voice, one song, lifting up the name of Jesus together. So I want to thank you all for coming first off because it's so important that we come. And when we come together in unity, that unity goes out and it blesses our entire city and surrounding area. Now, as one church, we have decided to give to the food pantry, which is very, very important. And I have this crazy notion that I believe Christians should actually be the most generous people on the planet. I don't know about you, but in Proverbs 19 and 17, it says, He who gives to the poor lends to me, and I will repay. I want to invite Vesna Mitchell up, who is representing the food pantry. If you could welcome her, that would be wonderful. Thank you, Philip. And uh, I just have to say, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, I am feeling so inspired and moved. I, I just have to say, you guys really know how to throw a party. So it's an absolute honor to be here today um, and sharing the New Market Food Pantry story. My name is Vesna Mitchell, as Philip introduced me. And I am the resource development coordinator for the pantry and my one of my official roles is the pantry storyteller. I have the privilege of connecting with, the, with our amazing community and to hear the stories 
of resilience and gratitude from the community members that we work with and that we serve. I'm gonna start with a little bit of history. The pantry was founded back in 1991 by a local nurse and her husband who noticed that we have a lot of hungry people in the community. And they started small. In fact, they started in the basement of a church. And as Newmarket grew, so did the need. Today, you'll find people from all walks of life coming through our doors, like the family next door whose father just lost their job as they renewed their mortgage, and now they have to choose between paying their bills or feeding their family. Or the woman who within three weeks lost her husband and her only child and is so paralyzed with grief she can't get out of bed and she can't go to work. Or the 60s scoop survivor who has never been reconnected with his biological family and to this day has to numb the pain in his body, in his heart, in his mind, inflicted on him by his abusers. And he can look me in the eye after taking a meal out of the community fridge to tell me how grateful he is to be alive that day. Or the child in your son and daughter's school who never brings a lunch. Or the newcomer who's left everything behind and has arrived here with nothing but hope. These are the faces of our neighbors, our community. It's through the generous support of our community and our volunteers that the pantry has, been, has grown from serving a few families a week to 1,100 in 2021. And then in 2022, we were at 1,300. 2023, we were at 1,600. And now in 2024, because of rising food and housing costs, last month, we broke a record at 2,100 people. That's over 800 families. And even with the outreach in initiatives that we have, like the community fridge, the demand still continues to grow every month. With a staff of only four, I'm one of four, and over 220 volunteers, somehow every day we're able to meet that demand, and so a little miracle happens. The story of Good Friday and Easter, I, I know I'm preaching to the choir here, literally, but it reminds us of sacrifice and selflessness. And that's the story of the New Market Food Pantry. It's neighbors coming together selflessly to support one another. So from the pantry, on behalf of the pantry, I wanna say thank you. It's together with acts of compassion like your food drive and fundraiser that we can offer a lifeline of hope to the community that we serve. Your contributions will not only help to nourish bodies, but they will also nurture a stronger and more compassionate new market. It's been an absolute pleasure being here and speaking in front of you today. And with Easter approaching, I hope that your hearts are filled with peace and joy, knowing that your contributions will really make a difference in someone's life today. Thank you very much and have a blessed Easter with your families. If I could ask those that are helping us with this offering to come forward, we never want to say we're taking an offering, right? We want to give an offering. But those of you who are going to help uh, pass out, thank you very much. Pass out the offering plates, I should say, not pass out. <laughs> now, you might say, how many ways can I give? Glad you asked that. There are three ways that you could give today. You can scan the QR code on the back of the screen right there. Awesome. You could text to give, or you can physically give, or you can do all three if you'd like. So we're going to pray and um, really ask the Holy Spirit what, you, what he wants you to give. Amen. 
Dear Lord God, we bless you and we praise you, God. Again, we thank you for this time that we can come together, that we can worship the name of Jesus together, Lord. And we're also grateful that we have the opportunity to give to such a great need. Lord, we do recognize that you love the poor. You love when we help out the poor. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would even tell us what you want us to give today. And so we ask that your name would be glorified, that this uh, offering would be multiplied to touch many people. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Amen. We're going to continue in worship, but I encourage you, just, just remain seated until the offering plate has passed you by, and then you can stand and join us in worship.
at my church at Crosslands, I often have to take some time to remind everybody that even though we're kind of the band and we're up here on a stage singing, it's really not ideal. Because we're not here to do a show. But we're here to, to lead you. You're the show. And Jesus is the recipient. He, he is the audience today. We have an audience of one person. And that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. And you know what? He's worth it. He's worth it. Regardless of how we feel or how our day is going, he is worth it. In fact, he is worthy of it all. <laughs> and so I'm just wondering if you could just lift our voice today. And if you're comfortable, I want you to raise your hands to Jesus today. And just block out all the distractions, everything going on around you. Just focus on the Lamb of God today. And just sing this with us. Worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. You're worthy of it all. Oh, let me hear you sing. Sing it out. time you were worthy. You were worthy of it all. You were worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve Now we've come to the, to the moment when Jesus, our Lord, was nailed to a cross. And I'm going to invite Pastor Jonathan from New Market Alliance Church to share with us. Good morning, everyone. What a, I'm just blessed to be with four churches in unity under the banner of Jesus Christ. And uh, on this journey this morning, we have been to an upper room receiving the Last Supper. We journeyed to the Garden of Gethsemane. We, we were on the Via Della Rosa carrying the cross. And now we come to an old rugged cross on a hill called Calvary or Golgotha. The way of Jesus, the, the gospel, his kingdom, it, it is so counterintuitive, isn't it? It's, it's, it's upside down. It's contrarian almost. I know it to be so because if, if I were to come up with a plan of salvation, a way out of our hopelessness and helplessness, out of our bondage to sin and addiction and habits and despair, it would not look like God's plan. And, you know, that's coming from, from me like a professional Christian, right? And it's just, um, I think we should pray a, 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 a 
prayer of gratitude that it was not my plan and it wasn't your plan. God's rescue mission for the world is perfect and yet it seems so upside down that it would involve this instrument of torture. Maybe the, maybe the most significant instrument of torture ever cr created, a Roman cross. And this cross becomes the wordless symbol for our faith and for our hope for 2,000 years. That alone is staggering. I, I wear, like I'm sure many of you do, uh, a cross around my neck every day. And I know I'm not the first person to make this observation, but could you imagine me wearing around my neck maybe another little symbol of execution, maybe a cute little electric chair. Um, or on the front of every church, there's, you know, a giant noose and gallows. Or all the cool millennials, you know, get like a guillotine tattooed on their arm. Y'all wouldn't be Crosslands Church. You'd all be like a lethal injection lands church or it just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And I know I'm being a bit hyperbolic here. I think we just need to be reminded once in a while how obscene this would have been in the mind of a first century person. And thankfully, we don't worship a God who's all that concerned about how we look. He allowed his son, the Bible says, to appear foolish to the world as he died on a cross, it says in 1 Corinthians. A God who allowed his, apostle, his apostles to appear foolish. The cross isn't only a monstrous and violent and scandalous object. The Bible says for an unbelieving world, it actually looks like foolishness. So if Jesus is co-equally God with the Father and with the Holy Spirit, what on earth is he doing nailed to a cross? It's the last place you would expect to see him. I think it would be fair to say that in our busy lives and the great stress that many of you are under, a lot of our free time, we, we would turn to distraction. Um, movies, books, TikTok, we're looking for distraction, something we don't have to think too deeply about or be too heavy. We like cute things. We like cat videos. But I, I invite you today, today of all days, that we would just stay in the, the tension a bit, the discomfort of the cross. Golgotha wasn't cute. The cross was not cute. The nails they drove into my Savior's hands, that was not cute, not something we can just scroll through. What an upside down kingdom. The symbol of the cross, which to the world at the time represented execution, shame, humiliation. And yet, and yet, it's not called Sad Friday. It's not called Ugly Friday. It's not called Hopeless Friday. It's called Good Friday. And what is good about this day and about this cross in particular, folks, not only does the cross of Christ stand at the very center of Christianity, it actually stands at the very center of world history. Every time you write that date, every time you type out that date, you are writing about Jesus Christ. History is divided into AD and BC. In fact, as, as Fred shared, the, the Latin word for cross is crux. So you could say the crux of Christianity is the cross. Christ's obedience to go through with this humiliation, to defeat sin, and then God's raising Jesus from dead to defeat death. It was all this plan so that what? That we could keep the Torah better, that we could be nicer people, that we could get our political party into office? No, because we have a much greater problem than that. 
a much bigger enemy. Here's what Hebrews says. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. God was interested in solving the death problem, which is something that currently affects 100% of us. God was interested in solving the problem of evil, and it was done on an old rugged cross. Like that song we used to sing, Christ is trampling over death by death. This is not a soppy, soapy, reductionist love that you find in the greeting cards and in Hallmark movies. This is a scandalous, blood and guts love that emerges from Calvary. And that self-denying love that crosses borders and barriers in the seen and the unseen world. And you today, Christian, have been given access and insight into God's great redemptive plan. We, we see the arc of history. We see the historical record of God's dogged love. We see the cross, the hinge of history. And we see the rise of this new family called the church, a new people living by the Spirit. But listen, and I'll close with this. Our invitation this morning is not come to the church. Our invitation this morning is not come to the Bible. As thankful as I am for the Word of God, the invitation is not even come to Christianity as a set of a doctrinal truths and, and a way of living. What we are shouting from the rooftops, what we are proclaiming from the mountains is come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to the perfect, incarnated, crucified, resurrected, ascended, enthroned, exalted, triumphant, glorified, reigning Lord Jesus, our King of Nazareth. Come to the cross this morning. Come and leave your baggage Come and leave your shame. Come leave your regrets, your sin. Come to the cross this morning. Oh, praise the name of our Lord Most High. Praise his name forever. Will you stand with me as we end this service? No, praise the name.
sun shall pierce the night. I'm going to rise with all you all will rise. Come on. Among the can't wait to meet you there. On we've had this morning with all four churches coming together and just a mass of people here and, and all singing praises to our Lord and you know we've heard some heavy things today and I don't want you to walk away from here and forget what you've heard this morning maybe take some time over the next couple of days and, and sit and ponder and just consider exactly what it is that God did for us and you know what it brings hope and joy because what we heard today is not the end of the story and and there's more and so um, I'd encourage you to find a church to go to on Sunday uh, we have four represented here there's this church Crosslands Church New Market Alliance Church Alive Church New Hope Methodist and we'd all be happy to have you come if you don't have a home church and so uh, go to church on Sunday hear the rest of the story and celebrate because Sunday will be a day of celebration because we know that, that Christ didn't stay in the ground, but he rose again. And so we look forward to, to that on Sunday. I'm just going to pray before we leave. God, thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. And God, you were, Jesus, you were tortured and beaten. And God, you went through so much for us. But God, you did it out of love, self-sacrificial love. And so God, we say thank you. Jesus, thank you for that sacrifice that you made for us. And as we leave here today, I pray that we would challenge ourselves to, to sit with that for a few moments and to understand exactly what it is and to just allow Allow that uh, thankfulness to enter our hearts for all that you've done. And God, we thank you that the story doesn't end here. We thank you that there's more to come. And so God, we, we rejoice and we thank you, Lord, in all that you've done. Be with us today and in all we do, in your name, amen. Feel free to hang out in the lobby afterwards and I think they're gonna sing again.